and the leadership said, I welcome you tonight in Jesus' name. Wonderful for you to be here. It's wonderful for me to be here. And the Lord will bless and enrich our lives in Jesus' name. His word will do good in your life. Will do good in your ministry. And through what we are hearing, it will prepare us to be better leaders, better preachers, and better ministers in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for our leadership session tonight. We thank you because you are here present with us. And we thank you for your spirit. We are praying, Lord, that your spirit will open the word to everyone and develop your people in Jesus' name. Make us real ministers, real leaders, and those who are developed to take the gospel to all our communities in Jesus' name. Be with us. Keep us awake and insert, inject your word unto everyone. Make us strong by the word. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. We're reading from 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. I read from verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God, that the child of God, may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You want to underline the word profitable in verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable. It's telling us that the scriptures actually came from the very mind of God, from the heart of God. That word that says is given by inspiration means it was breathed out. It came from his innermost being. It came from the depths of the well of the knowledge and revelation that could only come from God. And as it came, it came to man because man had found himself in a predicament. You understand that our relationship and fellowship with God is established and enriched by God's revelation of himself. And because our relationship is important, our fellowship is important, and the reconciliation we ought to have is also important. He has given us his word. He gives us this revelation. And it says, this revelation breathed out by God, inspired by God, given by God, is profitable. You want to recollect that we were created by God. You want to remember that God created us for himself. But man fell and lost the purpose of creation. We became empty after the fall. We became unprofitable after the fall. We became weak after the fall, we became sinful. The creator sent the restorer. He sent the redeemer to bring us back to himself and to restore us to the original stage and standing. Remember that? That's why Jesus came because of what happened at the Garden of Eden. That Eve and Adam disobeyed God. And he did what he told them, that if they did, they will die. And when they did, they died spiritually. And because of that spiritual death, God came to them, asked them questions, and challenged them. Why have you done what you have done? They gave excuses. You know the story? The curse came. They were driven out of the Garden of Eden, driven out of the presence of God. Relationship was broken. And now for that relationship between man and the thrice holy God, the eternal God, to be reconciled again, reunited again, we needed a redeemer. That's why Christ came. And that redeemer came. He died for us on the cross of Calvary to bring us back to the almighty God. Without his word, we're ignorant. We do not know, actually we'll not even know about the fall, We'll not know about the restoration. 
will not know about the redemption. We will not know about the way back to God. It is the word that gives us light concerning redemption. It is the word that gives us revelation concerning redemption. It is the word, the word he has given us that shows us the way back unto the Lord. That's why he has given us the word and it says all scripture. All these scriptures he has given us, they're showing us the various areas and the various aspects of the redemption that Christ has come to bring. And the word of God is full of everything we need that will bring us back to God, bring us back to Eden, bring us beyond Eden, and even take us to heaven. We're looking in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20. And I'm reading to you from verse 20. It says over here, And now I kept nothing back that was profitable unto you. Look at that word again, profitable. It's talking about the word of God. If our lives are going to receive edification, if our, life, our lives are going to receive enlightenment, if our lives are going to receive the instruction that gets us back to God, that will be profitable for us, we need the word of God. And Paul, the apostle said, I didn't keep it back from you. I showed you everything. I revealed everything to you. And he said, how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but I've showed you, I've revealed to you, I've taught you, I've expounded to you, and I've taught you publicly from house to house. Underline the word again, profitable. You see, it is the word that, re that uh, recalls us. It is the word that gets us back to where we ought to be. And because of that, the word is profitable in our lives. In verse 21, testifying both to the Jews. And also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. I'm reading here from verse 8 and then verse 9. In Hebrews chapter 13 verse 8, reading from verse 8 and verse 9, Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever in relationship with what we are talking about which is the word of god tonight in relationship with the prophet of the redeemer coming the restorer coming the savior coming and getting us back to god we're talking about jesus christ the living word in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god and he that what became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. And that word, the word personified, that word, the word living, that word, the final message of the Almighty God unto man remains ever the same, the same yesterday and today and forever. Look at verse 9 now. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. Understand the right doctrine, the true doctrine, the redemptive doctrine, the doctrine that saves. It's all in Christ. Salvation in Christ, forgiveness in Christ, grace in Christ, the truth in Christ, liberation in Christ, and total redemption, emancipation from the fall, all that from in Christ. And it says it's the same yesterday and today and forever. That's why it says now in verse 9, it says, Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace. It's a good thing that we know the word of God. It's a good thing that we know the grace of God. It's a good thing we know the plan of redemption. It's a good thing that we study, we learn how to get back to God in the grace of God, in the love of God, in the loving kindness of God. It says it's a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats. 
which have which have not profited them look at that which have not profited them you want to understand the word profit them it has not profited them which are occupied therein it's telling us there is something profitable and it is the word of god and when you come to the word of god it gives you profit because it leaks you with god it associates you with God. It brings you back to where you, where man had fallen and raises you up even higher than at that time. And that's the prophet we're looking at tonight. I'm talking to you tonight on deriving, on ending profit from God's word. Deriving, on ending profit from God's word. As you have your devotion in the morning, as you have your personal quiet time, as you have your family devotional time, as you have your personal study time, as you prepare, you want to dig deep into the word of God and you want to know how to get benefits out of the word, profit out of the word. How do you derive? How do you get? How do you collect your daily manna from the Lord? Deriving unending profit from God. God's word. The word profit is very important because if there were, if there's no profit, uh, you know, you just study, you just learn, there's no addition to your life, there's no growth in your life, then the devotion would have been worthless and useless. It is the profit we derive that actually makes us uh, happy that we have done devotion and we have uh, prayed to the Lord and the Lord has revealed himself in such a deeper way unto us. We're coming to Isaiah chapter 48. Isaiah chapter 48, and I'm reading from verse 17. Isaiah chapter 48, verse 17. Thus says the Lord thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord God which teaches thee to profit. In the word of God, it teaches us to profit. As we have devotion, as we have family quiet time, it teaches us to profit. And as we minister to other people and we look at the word of God, it teaches us how we can be of benefit and profit to the people we're ministering to. As we look at the word of God and we say everything I need is in this word and he is the one that teaches us to profit by his spirit. And so when we come to the word of God, personally or publicly, when we come to the word of God in the morning or in the evening, when we come to the word of God anytime, we're looking for what's the benefit here? What's the profit here? Because God says he teaches us to profit. Look at that verse 17. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord. He is still the Lord. He has not changed. I said he has not changed. It says, I am God, I change not. I am the Lord thy God, which teacheth thee to profit, which leadeth thee by the way that thou shouldest go. We're coming to the New Testament in 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. I'm reading here from verses 15 and 16. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Reading from verse 15. Meditate upon these things, upon the word of God, that is the word we read in the morning, the word we read in the evening, the passages we have gone through in the house fellowship, what we have learned in the central church, what we have learned in the district church or in the group, what we have learned from the word of God anytime, what we learned before, what we are learning today, what we we'll still keep on learning. It says meditate upon these things, Give thyself wholly, fully, fully, completely, entirely. Give thyself wholly to them that thy, what's the next word there? Profiting may appear to all. That is, it's not only that you know that you are profiting from the world, even the people that see you, the people that know you, the people that observe you, the people that live with you, the people that uh, kind of uh, have uh, some interaction with you, they will know that the world is working in your life. 
And it says that thy profiting may appear unto all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. That's why today we're looking at this word deriving unending profit from God's word. Deriving unending profit from God's word. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the guidebook of revelation for priceless profit. The guidebook, that's the Bible, is to guide us. That's the Bible, is to direct us. That's the Bible, is to lead us. It's a guidebook, but it's a guidebook of revelation. It's a revelation that will give us priceless profit, which means you cannot quantify the benefit. You cannot measure the profit priceless. The guidebook of revelation for priceless profit. Number two is goodness for recipients of his precious promises. His goodness for recipients of his precious promises. There are precious promises in the world, in the revelation he has given us. And those promises, remember, they are to age, they are to help in getting us back to where Adam was originally before the fall. And it's to lead us and guide us and bless us and lift us up until we're exalted to get to heaven. Those promises are to do that. And the recipients of his goodness, the recipients of his uh, precious promises, the goodness will be upon them like it will be upon you tonight. His goodness for recipients of his precious promises. Point number three the guarantee of rewards for profitable people. People who are profitable in the kingdom, profitable in the church, profitable in society, the way God wants them to be profitable. People who are profitable in the service of the Lord, in the kingdom of God, the guarantee of rewards for profitable people. Thank God I'm one of those profitable people. I said, I'm one of those profitable people. You will be in Jesus' name. Give me a good, good amen there. Yeah. We're looking at first, uh, the first point, the guidebook of revelation for priceless profit. We're coming to Isaiah chapter 34. Isaiah chapter 34. It tells us in Isaiah chapter 34, Verse 16, Isaiah chapter 34, verse 16. Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. You see that? If we're going to benefit in the revelation, if we're going to benefit in the scriptures, it says, number one, seek out the book of the Lord. Look for it. Get a copy. Buy one. And make sure that it's a Bible that is complete. Is authorized. It's a version that we know has not changed the original. It's keeping to the original. Seek that out. Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. What's, what's the benefit going to be for us if we don't read? Water in a glass does no, does no good to the thirsty. If, it does, if somebody the thirsty does not drink. And food in a plate on the table cannot do any good to the hungry if the man who is hungry will not eat. And the medicine that is recommended and even purchased and given cannot give healing to the sick if he does not take that medicine. Knowledge is useless to the ignorant until the ignorant will read and learn and apply that knowledge to himself. That's why the word of God is saying, seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read for no one of these shall fail nor shall none shall want her mate for my mouth it has commanded and his spirit it has gathered them you write down the word there read seek out the book read it in your quiet time, your personal devotion, family devotion, and in the church, you bring your Bible to the church, and you read the Word. But how about, 
after we have read, look at Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 26. There's a question here on reading. You've read the Bible, but look at this. Chapter 10 of Luke, verse 26. He said unto him, what is written in the law? What is written in the book of Revelation? That is the declaration of the word of God. What is written there? How readest thou? Very important. How readest thou? Do you rush through? I'm in a hurry. I need to, I need to read the Bible. I need to have family devotion. And if I don't have, I'll feel guilty. But I'm looking at the clock and I need to be at the bus stop at this time. And then I rush through. And if anybody asks you five minutes after, you don't remember what you have read. How readest thou? If you have read it and you have even understood it, how did you understand that? Is it historical? Is it something of the past? Is it applicable today? Is this talking to me? What's the Lord saying to me here? How readest thou? What shortcoming has this pointed out in your life? All that you have read today, and what improvement should you have? And how will this make you have the Christian experiences you ought to have? How readest thou? How has this one shown you in your personal ministry, in your relationship, husband and wife, relationship, parents and children, relationship, pastors and members of the church, relationship, workers and leaders? How has this shown you? I didn't do that right. I didn't go the right direction. How readest thou? What responsibility is this showing to you? What I've read today, that I need to do this, I need to do this, and the grace to achieve, and the grace to do it, this is how I'm going to have. How readest thou? After reading the word of God, I need to pray. Is my prayer cut off, separated, disjointed from the word, from the passage I've read, or is the prayer an outcome of what I read in the Bible, how readest thou? Do you understand what you are reading? Do you apply what you are reading? Do you know that that thing you are reading applies to you? Do you know that this revelation is sent to you so that it can do something definite in your life? How readest thou? Acts of the Apostles chapter 8. Acts of the Apostles chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 30. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, verse 30, it says, And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, and, and he said, Understandest thou what thou readest? That's another question. Yes, we have read the Bible. Yes, we have gone through the passage. What comes before that passage? What comes after that passage? What's the context of the passage? What's the meaning of this passage? How applicable is this passage to my life? Understandest thou what thou readest? Does this passage talk about Christ? Does it talk about the Savior? Does it talk about salvation? Understandest thou what thou readest? Is this talking about what he has done in the past? Is he talking about what he's doing for me presently today? Is this person talking about what he will do for me in the future? Understandest thou what thou readest? Is he talking about his first coming and all the benefits of his first coming? Or is this talking about the second coming and all the activities and events of that second coming? Understandest thou what thou readest? Is he talking about Isaiah alone? Is he talking about the Old Testament people? Or is he talking about the one to come? Is he talking about the one we're looking for? Or is he talking about me? And what's the connection between the personality I'm reading about there and myself? Understandest thou what thou readest? You see, when you read the word of God, you need to ask yourself questions. And you need to ask yourself, do I really understand what I'm reading? Look at verse 31. And he said, how can I? 
Understandest thou that what thou readest? How can I? How can I? Except some man shall guide me. I need somebody who has the Spirit of God because the Spirit of God is the author of this inspired word. And I need somebody who can explain this to me because I don't understand. And then he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. Uh, there are times, uh, you know, the family has a uh, devotion, and then we we'll say a boy, a girl of uh, eight years is the one to lead the devotion today. And then we we'll read the passage, and we we'll say, It's your turn today, you are eight years old, and you know, whatever you say today, that's all we're going to go by. Is that the right thing? And understandest thou what thou readest? That child of eight years of age, that child of 12, is going to teach the father and teach the mother and teach everybody and everything he says, uh, that money devotion for the family, let us take that to the Lord in prayer now. And you, your senior brother or your junior brother, has uh, given us the exhortation today. You are the one to pray today. And we're going like that, like that all the time. And we're actually having devotion. And do, do, do children, do they understand what they are talking about? How can they, except some man, the father, the adult, or the mother, the adult, who understands the word of God, will speak to us in that devotion, and then we will know we are getting something. And it says in verse 32, the place of the scripture which he read is this, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And like a lamb dumb before his sharers, so he opened not his mouth in his humiliation. His judgment was taken away. Who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, can you tell me of whom speaketh this prophet? Of himself or of some other man? Of whom speaketh this prophet? As you are reading the word of God, you need to understand who is this talking about? Who is this talking to? Who was the primary audience, the immediate audience, the initial audience? What's the transfer and the application to the people who are living today? That's how we understand the word of God. We read the word of God and we say this is what it meant originally to the original congregation, to the original recipient, and then the application. We transfer it to ourselves now. This is what it means for us today. The man wanted to know who is this talking about of himself, the prophet, of some other man, verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture. When you have a quiet time, when you have money devotion or evening, uh, you know, devotion and worship, the same scripture. We don't read the word of God and then we add some things in our minds to say. Uh, there's something the husband has been thinking about, about the wife. And it's something the wife has been thinking about, about the husband. And uh, they had not got a chance to iron things out. And now we have read the Bible. And then sometimes the husband or the wife will leave the passage we have read. And then will say, well, according to what I learned from this uh, passage today, you know what? This, this, and this, and actually, it's um, an indirect attack on the person he's talking to. We don't attack people when we're having devotion. We're there to worship God. We're there to understand the word of God and see its application to us. It says he began at the same scripture. And that same scripture, it said he preached unto him. Who did he preach? Jesus. And you know, as you look at any part of the Bible, anything you are studying, you must not go away from Christ. You go to Genesis, Jesus is there. You go to Exodus, Jesus is there. And you look at the blood of atonement in Leviticus, Jesus is there. As you are looking at numbers and see that, uh, uh, that uh, serpent of brass raised up, Jesus is there. As you come to Deuteronomy, I'll see the prophet, I'll send unto you like unto me, Jesus is there. As you come to Joshua, I'll see the 
captain of the host of the Lord. Jesus is there. Everywhere you go in the Psalms, Psalm 1, Psalm 2, Jesus is there. I just, as you come to the minor prophets, major prophets, Jesus is there. He began at the same scripture and he preached unto him, Jesus. You need to ask yourself, that passage you are reading, what's this saying about Jesus? What can I learn about Jesus? What's this talking about his first coming? What's he talking about his present ministry? What's he talking about his coming again? Look at uh, verse 36, and as they went on their way, they came to a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What does it mean to be baptized? The man knew already there is a decision to take after that word has been explained and expounded unto me. And he was hearing the word. It's not just that, well, we've had money devotion. It's not just that we've had a family devotion. What application are you going to make? And what definite decision are you going to make? What is the event that is going to take place in your life as a result of what you have read and what you have learned that day? It says, here is water. What does hinder me to be baptized? Look at verse 37. And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Look at the knowledge of the man. When he read at the beginning, understand this, that what thou readest, how can I? I don't even understand anything. What's this talking about? Is he talking about himself? Is he talking about another man? And as the explanation was given, as the exposition was given, he came to realize, number one, he's talking about Christ. Number two, Christ is the Son of God. Number three, Christ is a Redeemer. He's the one that came to save us. And while the Word of God was going on, he had accepted and believed. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ is my Savior. And then we're told in verse 38, and he commanded the chariot to stand still. He commanded the chariot to stand still. Nothing was forced on him. When you read the Bible aright, when you understand the Bible aright, and when you see the application of the Bible, you want to do something. There is something from your heart that wants to say from what I read today, from what I studied today, from what I learned today, this is the step I ought to take. And the man knew, the man knew, without anybody forcing him, that this is the step I ought to take. He commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down, both of them, into the water. Hold on, the man had never seen another person on the face of the earth baptized in water. The man was coming from Jerusalem and was coming from the background of Jewish religion. And he didn't know, he didn't understand anything about Christ, anything about water baptism, anything about conversion. From what he read that day and from what he studied that day, a change took place. And then Philip had spoken about quite a lot of things. That's why he said, what oh, forbids water? that I should, I should not be baptized. And they went down, and he was baptized. There's no argument. Are you going to dip me inside? Are you going to make a sign of the cross? You see, when you read the Word of God, it brings conviction to you. It brings instruction to you, and you understand it's so very clear. This is what you do, and that's the benefit of actually reading the Word, understanding the Word, applying the Word, believing the Word, obeying the Word. And it says, when they were come, up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught away Philip that the eunuch saw him no more and he went on his way. Tell me there. Tell me out aloud. He had joy of salvation. There was salvation there. It wasn't, a, you know, it's not like, hey, where is Philip? Who is going to guide me now? He knew that now a new life had begun. And when we read the Bible, when you study the Bible, if we study that aright, 
every new day is a new day of a new beginning. That you know from what I read today and from what I'm learning today, it's a new beginning and I can go to work now rejoicing. From what I learned now and from what I read and from what I understood and from the impact of the Spirit of God upon my life now, I can go to my market rejoicing. I can go my way rejoicing in verse 40. But Philip was found as to answer to us and passing through he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. We're coming to uh, Psalm 119. Psalm 119. And I'm reading here from verse 148. Psalm 119. Verse 148. In verse 148, it says, Mine eyes prevent the night watches, that I might meditate in thy word. It says, Mine eyes prevent the night watches, that is when night is coming. The end of the day is about to get here now, and then I don't just go to sleep. I say, no, I will not see sleep until I go into the watch of God. And then it says that I might meditate in thy word. The first thing in the morning, the word. And the last thing in the night, the word. And what he meditates on. You see, during the day, you hear the words of men. You interact with men. You interact with society. During the day, Satan might even speak to you like he spoke to Jesus Christ and said, if you are the Son of God, turn this stone into bread. You might hear the words of uh, that are contrary to progress and the, the words that will almost annoy you and the words that will jolt you. But as you end the day, if you ended your day thinking about the words you heard is a society, the words you heard from sinners, the words you heard from, you know, every dick and Harry, your life will be ruffled. Your life will not be the way it ought to be. But when you stand the final minutes of the night, the final minutes of the day, before you go to sleep, you read the word of God. Not just to read what you are doing, you are awake. And you also meditate on that word. It straightens out a lot of things. If there are things to cleanse, they are cleansed. If there are things to be forgiven, they are forgiven. If there are things to just, uh, you know, throw away into the depths of the sea, you throw them away because you meditate on the word. Uh, look at that same uh, Psalm 119. I'm reading from verse 9. Look at verse 9 there. Psalm 119, verse 9. Wherewithal shall the young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. You want to be cleaner? Take heed according to the word. Look at verse 11. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. You want to be victorious? Have good, rich, quiet time. Good, rich, morning devotion, evening devotion, and take heed to that word and keep that word in your heart. And then, verse 16, in verse 16, I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. When you read the word, you recollect, you remember, you will not forget. Look at verse 17. Deal bountifully with thy servant that I may live and keep thy word. It's not that, you, you know, you just read and then there's no intention of keeping the word that I might keep, obey the word. Verse 57. In verse 57, thou art my portion, O Lord, I have said that I would keep thy words. You had quiet time, you must make your vow, you must make your consecration. I read that, Lord, I will do that. Lord, I will observe that. Lord, I will keep that. I have said, I have promised, I have vowed, I will keep thy words. Verse 67. In verse 67, it says, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I have kept thy word. I look at the past, I see that, you know, life has not been straightforward. It's been up and down. My experience in the Lord has been here and there, but now, but now, as I read the word today, as I meditate on the word today, I take my decision today that I will keep 
his statutes. Look at verse 89. In verse 89, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. When we read the word of God, we're not asking, is that uh, still available today? That promise, can it still be fulfilled today? That commandment is still in history today. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Verse 101, 101, I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. When you have good, quiet time, then you take decisions. If I had read what I'm reading now uh, last week, I wouldn't have gone to that place. If I knew what I now know from this devotion, I wouldn't have interacted with that individual. If I had read this, understood this, if I had been into this scripture, the other time when I had this with that other, I wouldn't have done that. Therefore now I refrain my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. I'm looking at verse 105, verse 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. 130, verse 130, the entrance of thy words giveth light, it giveth understanding to the simple. If somebody is, uh, you know, simplistic, if somebody is superficial, if somebody is like, you know, just a uh, run-of-the-mill person, a person that, you know, you can get anything to him, you can push him into anything, you can cajole him into anything. But when he begins to read the word, learn the word, the word makes you wise. The word takes the stupidity and the foolishness and the simple turn attitude, takes that away. That's why it says over there in verse, uh, now look at verse 1. 33, verse 133, order my steps in thy word. Order my steps in thy word. You know, you can be disorderly, disorganized. It's like you don't know what, to, you're confused. You're at a crossroad. You are here, you are there, you are here, you are there. And you really don't know what the direction of your life is. But you know, you come to the word of God and say, I'm having quiet time today. And I'm, I'm having devotion today. I'm having it personally, I'm having it with my family, I'm having it in any way, or when in the church you are reading the word of God, you say, Lord, I'm disorganized, I'm confused. I don't know the direction to go. I don't know how to take the right decision. But in that verse, verse 133, order my steps in thy word and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. May it be fulfilled in your life in Jesus' name. Verse 140, verse 140, thy word is very pure. Thy word is very pure. When you come to the word of God, there's nothing to criticize. There's nothing to adjust. There's nothing to say, well, this verse of scripture, um, I think, uh, you know, it shall be like this. The word is very pure. If you don't understand, you don't understand. If it's uh, you that is confused, it's you that is confused. But the word of God, there's nothing wrong with the word of God. Thy word is very pure. Therefore, thy servant loveth it. Thy servant loves the word. And then in verse 169, verse 169, it says, let my cry come near before thee, O Lord. Give me understanding according to thy word. Give me understanding according to thy word. And so when we go through that, that's how to receive benefit from the word of God. That's how to have, uh, uh, that's how to have profit from the word of God. This uh, guidebook of Revelation contains everything we need. The word of God contains everything we need. The Bible contains everything we need for life and for ministry, for ourselves and for the family, for victory, for power, and for dominion. You will have dominion. And the, the secret of dominion, the secret of victory, everything is in the word. And for salvation, for satisfaction, it's there. And everything we need for health, for happiness, for holiness, everything is there. For our service and for success, everything is there. And for all our desires here on earth and our destiny in heaven is there. But we must read it. We must believe it. We must receive it. 
we must apply it to ourselves. We must make sure we understand and we take what is meant for us in that word. You will profit by the word. I said you will profit in the word. Point number two now, the goodness for recipients of his precious promises. The goodness for recipients of his precious promises. We're looking at Second Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 3. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 3. According as his divine power has given unto us, how many things? All things that pertain unto life and to godliness through the knowledge of him. Knowledge. Knowledge. Reading the word. Being instructed in the word, understanding the word, is through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye may be partakers of the divine nature. That is, when you read your Bible, when you have your quiet time, or when you come to the church, when you hear the word of God, by the things you hear, by the things you learn, you become a partaker of the nature of the Lord himself, having escaped the corruption that is the world through lost. What does the word do in us? Whether you are reading it personally, or you are reading it with members of your family, or you are reading it in a lunch hour break, or you are reading it in the fellowship, you are reading it anytime, learning it anytime, what does the word do for us, in us, and through us? Number one, it regenerates. The word of God regenerates. If we read it aright, if we apply it aright, here is what the word of God does. It regenerates. What does that mean? Look at James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verse 18. In James chapter 1, verse 18, it says, Of his own will, begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. He begat us. That means being born again, verse 21. In verse 21, wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive the, with all meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Bring salvation. That's regeneration. Regeneration. The word regenerates us. First Peter chapter 1. In First Peter chapter 1, verse 23. The word regenerates. Verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. Born again, born again by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Number two, the word cleanses us. The word cleanses us. We're looking at um, Psalm 119 again, Psalm 119. The word cleanses us. And if you're reading the Bible all right, and you're reading truly every morning, and you're learning every morning, you'll be cleaner today than you were yesterday. You'll be purer today than you were yesterday. And you'll be whiter than snow today than you were yesterday. Because the word, if read aright, the word, if understood, the word, if taken to heart, the word, if believed, the word, if we like to work in us, effectually, it's going to cleanse us. It tells us in Psalm 119, and reading from verse 9, it says, well, with her shall a young man cleanse his way, cleanse his way, by taking heed thereto according to thy word. We're looking at John chapter 15. John chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 3. John chapter 15, verse 3. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. And those words that were spoken unto them, they are recorded in the New Testament. And if we take those same words he spoke to them, it made them clean. And that same word is still mighty and powerful today. It makes us clean. The word regenerates. 
the word cleanses. Number three, the word sanctifies. The word sanctifies, purifies. We're looking at John chapter 17, verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You see, nobody can be sanctified without the enlightenment of the word. Sometimes you meet some Christians who talk about sanctification. They say, I don't believe that. They have not read the Bible. They have not studied the Bible. How can they believe? Since they have not read it. And it's the word, when the word comes in, it shows you the need for sanctification. The word comes in and it shows you the sanctifier who died on the cross of Calvary to purify and to sanctify you. When you read the word, the word shows you that this is the way walk ye therein. And it's no point again with people. Get them to the word. The word sanctifies. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 25. It says, husband, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it of the washing of water by the word. Washing of water by the word. The word acts like a cleansing agent. And then it sanctifies and purifies us, and it sanctifies and it cleanses by the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. I pray the word will do that in every life. Number four, the word heals. The word heals. You read the word of God and you take in the word of God, soak in the word of God, allow the word of God to get into your mind, into your heart, into your spirit, into your thinking, and allow the word of God to lead you into prayer. Then you pray in faith and the word heals. In uh, Psalm 107, I'm reading from verse 20. Psalm 107, we're looking at uh, verse 20. It tells us here in verse 20, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Uh, the Lord did not physically appear, appear to them, but he sent the word. Are you sick? The word is coming to you. You are going to get well. And it says, a saint is word, and the word healed them. Matthew chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 8. Matthew chapter 8, and we're reading from verse 8. Here it tells us in verse 8, Matthew chapter 8, reading from verse 8. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but tell me. Speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. The servant was far away. The servant was far away. But the word is mighty and powerful enough that when Jesus spoke the word, the healing came. And while the word comes to you from the pulpit here, while you are over there, your sicknesses are taken away. You believe that? It will happen. Number five, the word defeats Satan. The word defeats Satan. You cannot defeat Satan by any other means, by any other weapon. It's the word. It's the word that comes. And when the word comes, it defeats and destroys the works of Satan. Look at uh, chapter 4 of Matthew. Matthew chapter 4 verse 4. Uh, it says, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not lay by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. And that defeated the devil. Look at verse 7. And Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Look at verse 10. Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Verse 11. Then the devil leaveth him. When you speak the word, the devil will leave you. You believe the word, the devil will leave you. It's right to, you know, play some funny tricks on your heart, on your mind, on your body, and things they're walking about. When you speak the word and you say, it is written, that thing must get out of there. I said that thing will get out of there. 
Actually, as you look at Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6, reading from verse 16, Ephesians chapter 6, reading from verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench, how many fiery darts of the wicked? All the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, the devil will flee every time. Number six, the word bears fruit. The word bears fruit. If somebody is barren spiritually, it's the word that will bear fruit. If somebody is uh, fruitless, it doesn't have any fruit, unfruitful, it's the word that will bring fruit in our lives. We're looking at someone, and I'm reading from verse three. Someone reading from verse three, it's from verse one. It says, Blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in in the way of sinners, no seated in the seat of this comfort. But his delight is in the word of the Lord. And in his law, in his word, does he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. He that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leave also shall not wither. And whatsoever I do, whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. You will prosper in Jesus' name. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 23. Matthew chapter 13. And we're looking at a verse 23. It's the word. It's the word that comes to you and you read it. And you believe it. And you apply it. And you personalize it. That's what will bring fruit in your life. Matthew chapter 13 verse 23. But he that received good seed into the good ground. You see that here is the word. Here is the word. Here is the word. And understandeth it. Which also beareth fruit. And bringeth forth some. And hundredfold. And some sixty. And some thirty. You will bear fruit. The word number seven empowers with the spirit. The word leads us into the ocean of the enveloping of the immersion of the spirit of God is the word as you read the word and you desire the word and you're thinking of the word and you're meditating on the word the Holy Ghost will come to you in the fullness of the measure of his power I thought you'll say amen to that Acts of the Apostles, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10, Acts chapter 10, verse 44. While Peter yet spake these words, it's the word, it's the word. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them that heard the word. They were baptized in the Holy Ghost. Your own time has come, he'll fill you to overflowing. Look at chapter 11, chapter 11, verse 15. Chapter 11, verse 15. And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. As I began to speak, as the word was going forth, the Holy Ghost came on them as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord. How he, how, how that is said, John indeed baptized with water. But he shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. You will be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Immersed in the Holy Ghost. Deep completely and they overwhelmed with the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. The word number eight builds us up. Builds us up. If you're going to grow, it's by the word. If you're going to be built up, it's by the word. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, verse 32. Acts chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. It, when you are friends with the world, when you, when you go into the world, when you love the world, when you delight in the world, when you read the world, and when you try to understand the world, when you pray on the world, and when you embrace the world and becomes all in all to you, you'll be growing day by day. 
and you'll be growing every time. Then every time you come and you look at the word of God, you see something new and something fresh that will beautify your life. Look at uh, First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 1. First Peter chapter 2. Reading from verse 1. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes de desire the sincere milk of the world that she may grow thereby. Desire the sincere milk of the world that she may grow thereby. The watch produces faith. The watch produces faith. You know, if somebody is saying, uh, I, I want that mountain to be removed, I'm always going to brother so-and-so to pray for me because my faith level is low. I'm always asking sister so-and-so to pray for me because my faith level is low. I'm always asking so-and-so, so-and-so to pray for me because my faith level is low. When you read the watch, digest the watch, and um, meditate on the word and think on the word. That word will produce enough faith in you. Every mountain will move. I said every mountain will move. Uh, look at this, look at this, Romans chapter 10, we're reading from verse 17. Romans chapter 10, reading from verse 17. It says in verse 17, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 14. Acts of the Apostles chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 7. And there they preached the gospel. That means they preached the word. The gospel is the word. The word is the gospel. And there they preached the gospel. And there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. The same had Paul speak when he was preaching the word. When he was declaring the word, the same had Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him, perceiving that he had faith to be healed. The word produces faith. And then we're told, said with a loud voice, stand upright on thy feet. And he lived and walked. What did that? Not Paul, it's faith. And it's the word. The word produces faith. The word Walks wonders. Wonders in your life. Wonders in your family. Wonders in your local church. Wonders in our central church. Did I hear a good amen? amen? Look at this, look at this. Mark chapter 16. I'm reading from verse 20. The word walks wonders. We're looking at chapter 16 of Mark, verse 20. And they went forth and they preached everywhere. The Lord walking with them and confirming the word with signs following. And somebody shout. Yeah. Acts of the Apostles, Acts of the Apostles chapter 14. Acts of the Apostles chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 3. Acts chapter 14 verse 3. Long time therefore abode they speaking boldly in the Lord which gave testimony unto the word. Gave testimony unto the word. Gave testimony unto the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. The word conquers. Every problem you have, the word will conquer. Every challenge you have, the watch will conquer. And to conquer every evil power that tries to get near you, even from today, in Jesus' name. First John, First John chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 14. First John chapter 2, and I'm reading here from verse 14. I am reaching unto you, fathers. Because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have reached unto you, young men, because ye are strong. And the word of God abideth in you. That's the secret. The word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. I overcome. I said I overcome. Look at Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. Revelation chapter 12, we're reading from verse 11. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, it says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. They overcame him. We're going to overcome them. 
every evil spirit you are going to overcome. Every satanic attack you are going to overcome. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives even unto the death. Number 12, the word abides forever. The word abides forever. The same thing the word of God did in the first century in the Acts of the Apostles. That same thing the word of God is going to do today. In your local church, that Sin, that same thing the word of God will do. In your family, that same thing the word of God will do. Anywhere you go, you reach the word. You believe the word. You understand the word. You obey the word. And you pray in line according to the word. This same word will work wonders in every life in Jesus' name. Did I hear an amen? Uh, look at Psalm 119 again. Psalm 119, I'm reading from verse 89. Uh, Psalm 119, we're looking at verse 89. In Psalm 119, verse 89, it tells us about the word abiding forever. Verse 89 says, forever, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Forever, O Lord, thy word, everybody tell me is settled in heaven. Look at Psalm 89. Psalm 89. I'm reading from verse 34. Psalm 89, verse 34. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that is gone out of my leaves. Because that word abides forever. Because that word remains forever. And that word, the promises are still true today. I said the promises are still true today. Uh, look at uh, look at Isaiah chapter Isaiah chapter forty. I'm reading from verse eight. Isaiah chapter forty verse eight. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand for how long? Forever. The word of our God shall stand forever. Matthew chapter 24, we're looking at verse 35. Matthew chapter 24, we're reading from verse 35. In verse 35, it says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. The power of the word remains. I, I said the power of the word remains. And the authority of the word remains. Even though heaven and earth might pass away, will pass away, yet the word abides and remains forever. First Peter chapter 1. In First Peter chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 23. First Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth for how long? Forever. Verse 24, for all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the fall thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord, tell me, endureth forever the word of the Lord endureth forever and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you and so you understand uh, the benefits of the word the profit of the word the promises precious promises of the word the word regenerates the word cleanses the word sanctifies the word heals the word defeats Satan. The word bears fruit. It will bear fruit in your life. The word empowers us with the baptism in the Holy Spirit. The word builds up. The word produces faith. The word works wonders. The word conquers. The word abides forever. Point number three, the guarantee of reward. Your reward is guaranteed. As we serve the Lord, and we serve the Lord with earnestness, and we serve the Lord with faithfulness, and we stay on the word, abide in the word, there's a guarantee of rewards for profitable people. We're looking at Psalm 19, 1, 9. Psalm 19, I'm reading from verse 7. We're looking at Psalm 19, and we're reading from verse 7. In Psalm 19, verse 7, it says, The law of the Lord is perfect, 
converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. And then the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are day than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Look at this. Moreover, moreover, by them, by the word of God, which he calls statutes and he calls commandments and he calls laws, by them, by the word of God is a servant want. And in keeping of them, there is what? Great reward. In the keeping of them, there is great reward. Welcome to Isaiah chapter 48, verse 17. Isaiah chapter 48, verse 17. Thus says the Lord, thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord thy God, which teacheth thee to profit, which leadeth thee by the way, that thou shouldest go, O oh, that thou art hearkened unto my commandments. Then at thy peace been as a river, and thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. It says, if we hear his word, apply his word, interpret his word, embrace his word, delight in his word, personalize that word. It says, our peace will be like a river, and our righteousness will be like the waves of the sea. Thy seed, your children, also had been as the sand and thy offspring of the offerings of thy bowels, like gravel thereof, his name would not have been cut off. Your name would not be cut off, nor destroyed from before me. The word grants us reward, great reward. We're coming to Matthew. Matthew chapter 25. And I'm reading from Bastachi, Matthew chapter 25, Bastachi. If somebody is not uh, profitable, if somebody does not take in the word of God, and the word of God, it takes seed to give it to other people, and there's no profit, look at this, look at this. Matthew chapter 25, Bastachi, and cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. Unprofitable servant. I will not be unprofitable. You will not be unprofitable. You will be profitable in the kingdom in Jesus' name. You know, the man said he had only one talent. And because I have only one talent, that one has five, that one has two. I have only one. Okay, I'm grudging the master. Then I had that one talent. And then when the master came to take records, he said, here you have your own because it's only one. I didn't get more. And Jesus said in this parable, cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You'll not be like that. Matthew chapter 24, I'm reading from verse 44. Matthew chapter 24, verse 44. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour, as she think not, the Son of Man cometh, who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord has made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season. You are a preacher. Give the people the word in their season. I don't give them, you know, stale food. Prepare it afresh. Go deep into the word of God and prepare. Understand the needs of the people and be faithful unto the Lord. Then he tells us in verse 46, Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. Verse 48 but, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, that's a backsliding preacher. He begins to insult, he begins to abuse, and he begins to beat his fellow servants, he begins to criticize, he begins to cut down. 
the other people are also working for the Lord, it begins to belittle, it begins to depreciate other people are also serving the Lord. It's backsliding, it's backsliding. It begins to get angry on the pulpit and it begins to, you know, attack people on the pulpit. That's backsliding. It says, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and to drink of the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him and in an hour that he is not aware of and he shall, what will he do? Say it aloud now. Cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with who? With hypocrites. With the hypocrites and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I pray yours will not be like that. First Corinthians, First Corinthians, I'm reading from chapter 3, First Corinthians chapter 3, and we're reading here from verse 8, First Corinthians, we're looking at chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 8, First Corinthians chapter 3, reading from verse 8, it says in verse 8, now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, we're united, somebody is teaching such a scripture, the other person is preaching, we're united. Somebody is answering questions and the other one is singing. We're united. Somebody is ushering. The other one is uh, doing a, you know, technical work. We're all united. We're having the same goal and we're preaching the same word and we're helping the same congregation to get the best out of the service. You will not lose your reward. It says now, he that planteth and he that watereth are one, they're united, and every one shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. I see the rewardable people in front of me. And the Lord will reward you in Jesus' name. Look at chapter 9, chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 16. Chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians, in verse 16, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this sin willingly, if they are not dragging me to it, if, if I'm not saying, look at now, it's so tough to preach, it's so tough to minister, and you know, this and that, and they hold up on the way before you get there. It's so difficult to get to the leaders meeting, but they say that if we're not there, they will not allow us to teach on Sunday. If we're not there, we'll not do this. Okay, I will go. I pray you'll not be like that. We serve the Lord joyfully. And we serve the Lord cheerfully. And we serve the Lord with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind. Because we love him. Because he says, if I do this sin willingly, I have a reward. You will have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, what is my reward then? Verily that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power, abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more unto the Jews that became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews to them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law, to them that are without the law, as without law, not being without law to God, but under law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without the law. He says, to the weak I became as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things unto all men. I adjust, I adapt myself to all situations so that I might by all means save some. So that everything we're doing, we're making sure that we want to be of tremendous benefit, saving benefit, sanctifying benefit, healing benefit, delivering benefit, growing benefit unto the people who are listening to us. Look at this. We read and retain the word. We read the word. We retain the word so that we will reach out and rescue the perishing. We receive the word 
with all readiness of mind so that we can relieve the oppressed and we can release the captives. We taste the good word of God and the power of the world to come so that we can teach to transform all the lives, the lives we're speaking to. We practice the word that we learn so we can preach to persuade others for Christ. Because we're pleading with them, be ye reconciled unto God. We are strengthened by the word. We are made whole by the word so that we ourselves can send forth the word of God to heal others, to liberate others, and to make them whole. We open our hearts to the word and our eyes are open to the word of God so that we can open blind minds and open their prison doors. And Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give. We receive freely so that we can freely, fully, faithfully give unto others. We will be profitable. I will be profitable. Somebody there, I will be profitable. First Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy chapter 4. I'm reading to you from verse 8. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having the promise of life that now is and that which is to come. Verse 15, meditate upon these things. All that we have heard today, all that we have learned today, all that we see today in the word of God, meditate upon these things. Give thyself holy fully, completely to them that thy profiting may appear to all. From today, your quiet time will be richer. Your personal family devotion will be deeper. And then your ministration in the local church to the people you are preaching to will profit more people in Jesus' name. Meditate upon these things. Pray on them. Pray them in, have them totally injected into your system. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that their prophet him may appear to all. I will see you prophet. I'll hear that you are prophetic. I'll hear testimonies that you are prophetic in the world. Take it to thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, Thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. You will not be lost. Amen. That heaven will get you there together. Amen. And all your converts and all your members and all our members together will all get to heaven together in Jesus' name. Amen. Take it unto yourself. Take it unto the doctrine. Continue. In doing that, thank God, you will endure until the end. And the people that hear you, you will get to heaven. Tonight, we're going to pray everything in. Are you ready to pray? Let's rise up and really, really, really pray and talk to the Lord tonight so that the profit in the world, the profit of the world, unending profit from God's word, you know how to derive them, and they will be yours. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer.